Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome back to New Books in Political Science, a podcast on the New Books Network. I'm Susan Lee Bell at St. Joseph's University, and today I'm joined by Professor Chara torres Bellasi to discuss her new book, Corporatocracy, How to Protect Democracy from Dark Money and Corrupt Politicians, published by NYU Press in 2024. New Books Network has hosted scholars from many fields who have brought their expertise to identifying the threats to American democracy. In her new book, legal scholar Professor Torres Bellasi argues that the United States' private-funded campaign finance system, combined with corporate greed and anti-democratic strains in the modern Republican Party, endangers American democracy. As she sees it, Unseen political actors and untraceable dark money influence our elections, while anti-democratic rhetoric threatens a tilt towards authoritarianism. Drawing on key Supreme Court cases, she explores how corporations have undermined democratic norms, practices, and laws, from bankrolling regressive politicians to funding ghost candidates with dark money, Professor Torres Bellasi exposes how corporations subvert the will of the American people, yet courts struggle to hold corporate interests and corrupt politicians accountable. If American democracy is going to thrive in the long run, then the deep pockets of the largest corporations cannot be allowed to join focus with the anti-democratic fringe. Professor Torres Bellasi fears a repeat of the January 6th insurrection, but with an expanded corporate sponsorship. She outlines the ways in which corporate forces might be held accountable by the courts, their shareholders, and citizens themselves. Along with other reforms, she proposes a democracy litmus test that requires loyalty to democracy in politics and the economy. Professor Chara torres Bellasi is a professor of law at Stetson Law. She is also a Brennan Center fellow at NYU Law School, who has testified before Congress as an expert on campaign finance and has helped draft Supreme Court briefs. Previously, she authored Corporate Citizen and Political Brands, and I'm delighted to welcome her to the New Books Network. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, you're really motivated to write this book, and that's because you look at American democracy and you do not see a sort of robust, thriving system. So what, as you see it, is the state of American democracy and and what should we be most concerned about? So I was inspired to write this book because of January 6th. Uh, I was a former Senate staffer uh, right out of college, and it just so happened that when I worked at the Capitol, uh, two Capitol police officers were killed in the line of duty. I remember going to their funeral in the rotunda. And so when I saw January 6 unfold, it really hit me quite hard. Uh, I could not believe that thousands of people were attacking Capitol Police officers and other law enforcement that day. And they were doing it on a day that was required by the US Constitution. Congress was there to certify Biden's electoral win. And they actually interrupted that democratic process. And that is really disturbing because ever since 1801 in the United States, we've had peaceful transfers of power between our two political parties. And so this is a great rupture in the democratic process. And I wanted to write about that. And because I look at things through a money and politics lens, one of the first questions I asked is, was there any corporate money behind this? And then further, how are corporations gonna change their political behavior in light of this momentous event? And so that's what sort of got me on the path to writing this book. So you are a campaign like finance person and you look at really detailed laws. One of the great things about this book, I really enjoyed reading it, is how on the one hand, you're bringing this enormous, enormous expertise to things that are sometimes complicated, but you have a remarkable capacity for explaining this. This is a book that can be picked up by 
anybody. It, it is an academic press book, but anybody can pick this book up and read it from you know, a dedicated high school student to a graduate student to somebody who is studying these things. And I, I have read all of these books and interviewed many of the authors of, of, of these books that are trying to figure out what is the threat to American democracy. And we'll link to some of those other interviews in the show notes. But this is a, a very different approach because uh, of you tracing the money and focusing on, on corporations. So, uh, and the, the book is divided into three parts. First, you try to sort of, uh, not sort of, you, you demonstrate how corporations behave, and then you talk about why that behavior puts democracy on what you call a knife's edge. And then the last part is about fixing the problem. So there's a lot of bleakness in this book, but there is also a lot of productive, conversation at the end, which is not always the case. So I, I really appreciated that because I think we have to face what is problematic in a in a in an unsanitized way. And I think you 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 do that. So let, let's start up with like how corporations are behaving badly. Um, you know, you say the the con consumers may be unwillingly supporting companies that that actually oppose their own political values or are contributing or and are and or are contributing to the weakening of democracy. So can you explain that? Like, why should we be so concerned about about corporations? So I worry about sharing a democracy with corporations just because the largest corporations in America have more money flowing through them than many small countries. So it is awkward at best to share a democracy with an entity that has a market cap of over $100 billion, which uh, that number uh, refers to a company called Next Era Energy, and they were at the center of a scandal here in Florida in 2020 called the Ghost Candidate Scandal. This was a, a, essentially a plot by Republicans in the state of Florida to trick Democratic voters to vote third party so that Republicans could win. And in the three races where they ran these ghost candidates, the Republican won. In other words, this plot was completely successful from an electoral point of view. And one of the things that I write about in this book is the problem of dark money. So what I mean by dark money is money that's spent in an electoral process where the public does not know where that money came from. And there was dark money in this ghost candidate scandal as well. And the only ways that the public ever finds out the true sources of dark money is either we have litigation or a leak. And in the ghost candidate scandal, we happen to have a leak. So we have a whistleblower who has been giving documents to the press in Florida. And because of those whistleblower documents, we can now see that the source of the funding for the ghost candidate scandal was an entity called Florida Power and Light, which is a huge utility in Florida. And the, the reason this has to do with Next Era Energy is Next Era Energy owns Florida Power and Light. So you have to sort of know a lot of corporate law and a lot of campaign finance law to like disentangle what is going on with some of these scandals. And, and who's named what? I mean, you, you make this point over and over in the book, like it, 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 there isn't transparency, which is interesting because, you know, in, in my business and political theory, you know, people often talk about capitalism and democracy or constitutional democracy as, as like these 18th century cousins that are mutually reinforcing. But the argument that you're making is that in the modern era, it is not the case that corporations are necessarily uh, supporting democracy and they can be subverting it and there is this lack of transparency. I, I want to back us up because I loved this book and I just want to race ahead, but I know that not every listener is familiar with the American private campaign system. J just say really quickly why it is that corporations can give this money and why you would need litigation or a leak to know 
who? Because if I donate money, you know, my name is attached to it. What, what, so people could see. Uh, so there's some sort of accountability. If I was giving to right-wing dictators and uh, people might know and that might have repercussions for me. What, why? So how does the system work and why is it that corporations can operate behind a curtain? Okay. So uh, corporations have been regulated in federal elections starting in 1907 with a law called the Tillman Act. The Tillman Act is still in effect. It actually survives uh, the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United in 2010. Uh, so that's the first attempt to regulate corporations at the federal level. And that bars corporations from giving money from their corporate treasury directly to a federal candidate. But there are lots of lawful ways for corporations to get their money into federal elections. So the two big ways that corporate money comes in is either it goes through a corporate PAC. So a corporate PAC is actually created by the individuals who are associated with that corporation. And at the federal level, individuals can give $5,000 a piece into that corporate PAC, and then the corporate PAC will spend in politics. And that is perfectly lawful. The other big way that corporations spend at the federal level is through entities called super PACs. So super PACs were created after Citizens United, which is that 2010 Supreme Court decision, which says that corporations have a First Amendment right to spend as much money as they want to in politics, so long as they spend it independently of candidates and political parties. So uh, Citizens United didn't actually create the super PACs. It was a, not, a follow on decision uh, called Speech Now. So after Speech Now, the uh, FEC allows for the creation of these super PACs. So a super PAC gets to take in money from any source so long as it is not from a foreign national, which means that they can take in money from super wealthy individuals, PACs and, sorry, uh, unions and corporations. So the money that comes into super PACs is completely unlimited. And so you can have a donation to a super PAC that is in the multi millions of dollars. And then the super PAC is supposed to spend its money independent of any candidate or political party. So those are the two big ways that corporations can spend at the federal level. And then meanwhile, we have this system of federalism in the United States. So each of the 50 states has their own election laws that deal with state elections. And each of the 50 states also has their own campaign finance laws. And so in half of the states, corporations can give directly to state candidates. And then in the other half of the states, they essentially have mini Tillman Acts and they bar corporations from giving directly to state candidates. So the I'm sorry, that's a long winded answer. But the question of how corporations can give really varies depending on the type of election. Now, your other question was why- hey, I'm gonna pause there. Absolutely, yeah. that was masterful because what you've summarized in a really short and effective way is the development of this money in politics system. It's not that money has never been in politics before uh, uh, you know, the 20th century. And you've also highlighted how it is that there has been a long-term attempt to keep that money out but this current Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, has interpreted money as speech and has interpreted corporations as people who have rights. And that's new and fairly radical uh, idea, not one that we can trace back uh, to the 18th, 19th, or even the 20th century. So thank you for the detail. It was fantastic. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but fantastic. Uh, so your other question was, <laughs> if you have to give money under your real name, why do corporations get away with not spending under their doing business as names, which is a perfect question. So 
you are required to have your name on your donations because we have disclosure requirements at the federal level. Now, corporations are really good at gaming the system here. And if they want to spend in a way that doesn't put their name on their money, what they do is they route it through an opaque nonprofit. So the two most typical ways to make dark money dark is you have a corporate donor, they give to a 501c4, which is a social welfare organization, or a 501c6, which is a trade association. And once they give that money to that opaque nonprofit, no one in the public will be able to tell the true source of that funds. What they will see is the C4 or the C6 spending in politics. What they won't be able to see is the true source of the money, whether it's a corporation or just a single wealthy billionaire. Um, okay, so there's a, this enormous flow of money. It's very hard to keep track of. And you're worried about where it's going. And part of what you do in this first part of the book is kind of tell us. There's been a lot of attention, for example, paid to the carceral state and how many people benefit from the expansion of prisons. One of our recent interviews here uh, uh, on the power of the badge focuses on how local sheriffs benefit from fees charged to people in jails. But, but you emphasize that this actually isn't just about profit, which is, is, is generally how it's written about. It's what you call the civil death of many Americans. So uh, what does it mean to be civilly dead? And how do corporations benefit from that civil death? What's the interplay there? Yes. So civil death is a legal concept that goes back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Uh, so those were some of our first democracies. And uh, the, the, the phrase civil death today means those collateral consequences that come with a criminal conviction. Uh, and in the United States, it really varies by state what the collateral consequences are and how severe your civil death is. So for example, in Maine and uh, Vermont and DC, you can actually vote while you're incarcerated. But in the other 48 states, you lose your right to vote when you are incarcerated. And that is part of your civil death, which means that you have no ability to vote while you are in prison. And depending on how long your sentence is, that could be for the rest of your life, or if you have a shorter sentence, it's just while you are incarcerated. And then there is this variety of different approaches for when you get that civil right back. Uh, and you know, in the state of Florida, there's been a huge attempt to reform our system. But for most of Florida's history, if you lost your right to vote because you had a felony conviction in your past, you essentially lost it for your entire life. And the voters of Florida tried to fix that in 2018. We passed a new amendment to the state constitution. And then our legislature and our governor swooped in and sort of ruined it. Uh, they decided that in order for you to get your rights restored, you had to pay off all of your fees and fines. And the Kafkaesque part of this is that Florida doesn't have a centralized place where you can double check that you've paid all of your fees and fines. So many people, A, don't know how much they owe. Others know what they owe, but they could never come up with that amount of money in their whole lifetime. And so the net effect of all of this is that the nearly uh, 1 million people who were disenfranchised um, because they had a felony conviction and thought that they were about to get their rights back because of this uh, Amendment 4 in 2018, are still in this horrible legal limbo where they are not allowed to become voters. So their civil death, in my words, is continuing. 
It's it's shocking, uh, really. Um, and you know, you, uh, as you were describing it, you're talking about the individual people, but this also has a kind of communal effect because this means that everyone who is incarcerated's interests can't be represented. So that means that if there are issues with criminal justice, there is no way for the people who experience them to actually register that with the people who. Uh, um, who who have been elected to govern. So it, it has so many consequences. Um, the second part of the book is about like why democracy is in trouble in the United States. Uh, and you've already talked about ghost money and ghost candidates uh, and the repercussions that that has. The idea of being able to manipulate an election by putting in a candidate who isn't a real candidate in order to siphon away votes. But you go through a few other uh, shocking examples of how illegal money enters elections and how, uh, and you alluded to this earlier, how it is that the insurrection was connected to some of this money. So can, can you tell us a little bit about these other examples that really um, create the impetus for, for you to write this book? Sure. Uh, so one of the things I want to make really clear is that Neither political party has a monopoly on corruption. Sadly, it's a very bipartisan problem. And so one of the uh, examples that I have in this book actually has to do with the re-election of Barack Obama in uh, 2012. So in a nutshell, that story is we have this businessman, his name is Joe Lowe, and Allegedly, what he really wants is a picture of himself with the sitting president, which would be uh, Barack Obama. And in order to achieve this goal, he gives a rapper named Pras Michelle, he's a member of the Fugees, a rap group. He gives Pras Michelle $20 million to get this photo opportunity. And then Pras Michelle uses this money to spend in the 2012 election, but he doesn't spend it under his own name, which would be the least problematic way of doing this. He gives the money to straw donors, and then those straw donors end up giving money to PACs that support Obama's reelection. Now, this is Ill illegal for a number of reasons. So number one, Joe Lowe is not allowed to spend one red cent in American elections because he happens to be a Malaysian uh, foreign national. And foreign nationals are not allowed to spend money in, a, in an American election. And, and with <laughs> the understanding that we're trying to keep out certain influences. And so this one there seems to be trying to hold the line on, but the other influences is, is, is really what seems to be quite lax here. Yes. So it's also illegal because uh, there were shell corporations that allowed this money to get into the United States in the first place. And using those corporate structures violates our good friend, the Tillman Act from 1907. It's also illegal to use straw donors when you are spending money in American elections. And the reason for that is we have contribution limits at the federal level. and But federal contribution limits would be meaningless if you could just make up imaginary donors and spend under all of their names. So we don't allow people to do that. We also don't allow people to sort of spend money in the name of another person for the same reason it would just make all of the contribution limits completely meaningless and so that is illegal uh and so almost every possible way you could break a campaign finance law is broken uh in the joe Lowe story including the fact that the reason joe Lowe had all of this money to spend is he had stolen it from a sovereign wealth fund in malaysia so they're you're using stolen money to break American campaign finance laws. Also, Joe Lowe can get a picture with Barack Obama and spoiler alert, he gets the picture with Barack Obama, which blows my mind. So you can look this up online uh, and you will find a picture of Joe Lowe standing next to uh, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. They're in front of the Christmas tree at the White House. So. Uh, and Joe Lowe is still at large, like he's never been caught. But Pras Michelle was prosecuted for all of this. 
and he is facing years in prison for his participation in this campaign finance crime. And we'll talk later about prison and jail time and why you think actually it's very important for us to think about consequences that can be applied to people. But we'll hold off on that for a minute. You, you also, and I'm recording here today from New Jersey, so we've got Bob Menendez and then across the river we have um, Eric Adams who is accused of, of, so we're not in any way suggesting that corruption is in, in one party or the other, but your emphasis in this book is the insurrection. That's, that's kind of why, that's the thing that you see as violating the peaceful transition of power and the norms that we have. The petty corruption is something that we have always had in the United States, and it is not owned by any of the parties. Um, as last night, I had the conversation with my son about who Dan Rostenkowski was and what he did. So, um, but you do look at Donald Trump in the 2016 election and uh, where the money was there. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about about that before we talk about how the money played a role in the insurrection. Yes. So. Trump in his 2016 run made a big point of saying that he was a self-financed candidate. He made a pitch to the voters that this showed that he would be independent of political donors and thus more trustworthy. And this claim was only 20% true. So in the 2016 election, Trump himself only provided 20% of uh, the campaign funds that went into that election. So another way of thinking about that is that 80% of the money that supported Donald Trump was uh, from other people's money. If you fast forward to 2020, uh, Trump puts exactly zero dollars of his own money into his reelection campaign, and he is following that same pattern in 2024 all of uh, his latter campaigns are being bankrolled by other people. And so this independence that he was feigning in uh, 2016 is sort of um, uh, laughably gone in 2020 and 2024. And some of the support for Trump uh, in 2016 included money from um, a prison corporation called Geo Group, They were the only publicly traded corporation to support Trump's election in 2016 on the record. And they reaped the the rewards of having Trump in the White House. Uh, Some of Trump's border detention policy was implemented by private prisons, including the GEO Group. So at the end of the Obama administration, uh, the Obama administration was trying to get the federal government to basically break ties with private prisons. Uh, and once Trump was uh, elected, that policy was changed. And so during the Trump administration, private prisons were, were used again by the federal government. What about the insurrection? What, what, how did how did corporate money play a role? I mean, one of the premises of the book is that is that the money, there is so much money that in a second iteration, money could be even more important. But you you do identify money in um, in, in the January 6th insurrection. Yeah. So where I saw corporate money um, related to January 6th, and I, I, let me back up for a moment. I think one of the things that we are extraordinarily lucky when we come to January 6th, like it's that's such a weird way to frame it, but I think we were lucky that there was not much corporate money that was backing January 6th. Uh, and what I fear is what happens if we have a repeat of January 6th where there is major corporate sponsorship. But the money that I could see was money that flowed through an entity called the Rule of Law Defense Fund, which I think most people have not heard of. It is an offshoot of a group called the Republican Attorneys General Association, better known as RAGA. And RAGA uh, has its majority of its funding from 
publicly traded corporations and their trade associations. And so one of the things I put in the book is the top donors uh, to Raga in 2020, which is the relevant period right before the insurrection. And the reason why I focus on the rule of law defense fund is they put out uh, robocalls that encouraged people to come fight at the Capitol on January 6th. So it wasn't just Trump and his tweets that was inviting uh, the insurrectionists to the insurrection. We also had uh, the rule of law defense fund, which is this offshoot of the Republican attorney generals association. It's all in some ways, this is wild that they are essentially uh, telling people to come to an insurrection, but there it was, they did. Uh, and you know some of the donors uh, to RAGA included, I'll just rattle them off, these are the, the top 10, uh, Anthem Blue Cross, Altria, Comcast, Walmart, AT&T, CVS, Home Depot, Anheuser-Busch, uh, Fresnius, and Pfizer. So these are pretty like, blue chip brand name companies and i sort of doubt that when they gave this money that they thought that they were funding an insurrection but one of the things i also look at in this book is the behavior of corporations after january 6th so one of the things that i had never really seen before in studying corporate political spending for nearly two decades was corporations voluntarily saying that they would stop their political spending, which is exactly what lots of them did after January 6th. They made public promises. We will not fund what are um, critically called the Sedition Caucus. So what I mean by the Sedition Caucus is those Republican members of Congress who refused to certify Biden's electoral win. And so after January 6th, you get these statements from corporations who say, we have learned our lesson, we're going to be better, we are not gonna fund these people. And most corporations made that promise and then broke it. And so what you can see is after January 6th, AT&T, Comcast, Home Depot, Walmart, and Pfizer are still giving money to the Sedition Caucus. And my good friends over at Crew have been tracking corporate money that goes to the Sedition Caucus ever since January 6th. And they are approaching $150 million in corporate PAC funds that are going to these uh, problematic individuals who are still in power in Congress. And that I think needs more attention from the public because if you think that this is a problem that we have the elected most of the Sedition Caucus, which I think is a problem, then A, you need to think about who you're going to vote for in the fall uh, so you don't keep on empowering these same people. And then also look behind the curtain. (laughs) Who is funding these people? And ask the question as a consumer and as an investor, should I be giving my money to these corporate structures that are supporting these problematic politicians. I just want to take a moment to reflect on all that you've just said, because it's so much. And when I got to, I consider myself fairly well read on, on these things. Uh, and I do, you know, did I know that the rule of law defense fund, like as I was going through the details and as you traced the money to state Republican attorney generals, It really hits home what has been said and said many, many times, which is that we are watching a destruction of rule of law. So, you know, I teach Locke and I used to teach peaceful transition of power and it was kind of a no brainer. And I could sort of compare what Locke is talking about and show how it has worked in the United States. And this is no longer the case. Now, this is something that needs to be understood because students are living in a world in which the peaceful transition of power is not something to be taken for granted in the United States, but yet they are being acculturated to that. 20 years ago, the idea that Republican attorneys generals would be supporting an insurrection is, would have been bananas 
Um, so it, this is a kind of new form of conservatism in which it's accompanied by this attack on the rule of law and a willingness to throw away norms, laws, traditions that were kind of considered no-brainers. Everyone agreed on something like the peaceful transition of power. It didn't, it didn't divide Democrats and Republicans. And what's interesting, like right after January 6th, is you heard some of those Republicans say, this was terrible, My, McConnell, Senator McConnell. And then weeks later, they were not willing to um, impeach the president. They weren't willing to say things publicly. You, you were saying that the voters should, you know, pay attention to these things. And it's hard. They should buy the book and read the book. And we all need to read the papers. But I was thinking about the the papers, um, Chara, and I was wondering, okay, why is this list with Pfizer mm -hmm. so shocking to me? Why did I not know that? Um, uh, and again, I can't say it enough. This is a really important book for people to read before the, the, the election. Even if you know who you're voting for, this is an important book to read because as you're talking to people, particularly those people who are teaching people, they you need to have this part of the story. But was there a tension in the press that I just was asleep at the wheel for? Uh, why has the press not come down on these corporations that continue to fund, and I love your term, um, uh, of uh, the Sedition Caucus. That's just, it's terrific. <laughs> that is um, a, a great question that I don't have a good answer to. I mean, on the one hand, there are independent journalists uh, like Judd Legum, who does excellent work. He's been tracking corporate political spending for years now. And he was one of the first people to call around to different corporate PACs and ask them whether they were going to continue their support. Uh, so this is like in the weeks after uh, the insurrection. And he was able to get people on the phone who and who then made these statements like, we're, no, we're going to stop. We're going to stop. Uh, but his work for whatever reason does not tend to get picked up in um legacy more, newspapers in, 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 yeah and and i think that's a shame so you know the campaign finance nerds know all of this <laughs> uh but getting the the you know the generalized press to pick it up is a challenge Again, I'm not expecting you to answer this question, and we'll just we'll set it aside. But it's interesting because we assume capitalism would make legacy newspapers interested in this. This is a great story that would supposedly sell newspapers, but maybe not. Maybe it's threatening to corporate structure in a way that they're not willing to touch. Maybe candidates feel, uh, you know, sensitive about attacking companies like Pfizer that are in states, blue states, uh, that um, um, this is why I think your book is so important. And I think it's a little bit different from, uh, you know, Four Threats to Democracy and How Democracies Die and many of the other books that we've done. All of them incredibly important to our understanding of what's happening right now in the United States. But I think your book adds something that has not been covered in some of the others. Okay, I said that this was going to get bleak, so it did. And, um, uh, and the Again, one of the geniuses of the book is the way that you deal with incredibly complex um, acronym filled issues, but, you know, in a very, very clear way. Um, so it's uh, again, it's just it's, that's a joy to read. You are committed to fixing the problem. Uh, one of the things that you suggest is um, dusting off the disqualification clause as a way to hold Congress accountable. And I'll remind people who have not dusted off their constitution today that the disqualification clause reads, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state 
who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. And, and we've heard this because this clause has been attempted to be used. Um, but, but you have some suggestions about how it might be applied. H how could this put in in the 19th century be helpful to us in the 21st century? So two of the cases that I talk about in this book had to be rewritten several times while we were going to production because one of the cases was actually out up at the Supreme Court um, while this book was being finalized. And so I sort of literally didn't know how one of the chapters was going to end until very late in production. So the first case that I talk about is the case of Cooey Griffin. So Cooey Griffin was a uh, county commissioner in Otero, New Mexico. And in 2022, he made news because he was part of one of these commissions that would not certify an election because they were using Dominion voting machines. So the Secretary of State in New Mexico had to like basically overrule Cui and his little commission and like certify that election. And shortly thereafter, his constituency move to have him removed from office. And the reason that they did this is he was at January 6th. And I think one of the interesting things about his case is everyone agrees that Cooey Griffin was not violent that day, but he was cheerleading violence that day. And so his constituents argued to the courts in New Mexico that cheerleading also makes you an insurrectionist. And the courts agreed. And so they removed him using the disqualification clause retroactive to January 6, 2021, which is when he participated in the insurrection and disqual therefore disqualified himself from holding public office. The, the other case is much more famous. So the Anderson case was filed in Colorado. And the argument there was that Trump also should be disqualified from being on the ballot in 2024 because of his behavior on January 6th. And the Colorado Supreme Court really surprised people because the Colorado court actually applied this part of the constitution to Trump as I think they should have. And they said, no, you participated in an insurrection, therefore you can't be on the Colorado ballot. It gets appealed to the Supreme Court, the Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court reverses. And I, and they do it in a really, I feel like hyper technical, not in the spirit of the constitution way. What the U.S. Supreme Court decides is uh, the states cannot disqualify a candidate for the presidency. Only Congress can do that. And they went sort of further than they really even needed to. They also specified that Congress is going to have to pass a new law to uh, invalidate uh, presidential candidates from being on the ballot in the future if there is a future insurrection. And I think because of our ex post facto re requirements in the uh, Constitution, I don't think this could ever apply to Trump. So. This is one of these get out of jail free card decisions from the Supreme Court, which they've made a, several of at this point. I mean, we could talk about the Trump immunity thing in some other time because that happened uh, too late to actually get into this book. But with the disqualification clause, now that we have the Anderson decision from the Supreme Court, I want Congress to actually pass a law that makes it clear if you engage in an insurrection, then you cannot hold public office, which is precisely what the uh, the text of the Constitution already says. So it's super frustrating that we have to do this extra step, but the Supreme Court is requiring this extra step. And so I hope that Congress follows through. And do you think that law would apply to the Sedition Caucus as well, that people who said, I will not certify an election 
would also count as participating in an insurrection, a, a, a refusing of the peaceful transition of power, or would that be left to the interpretation of a court? I think that this would also have to be adjudicated. One of the things that Congress has that the president, at least until the immunity decision, didn't have is in the, the Constitution, you have the spe speech and debate clause. And the speech and debate clause essentially says, like, you can't arrest uh, a member of Congress while they are giving a speech on the floor or debating legislation. And I think there is a argument that whatever Congress was doing that day, it probably falls under speech and debate and is probably immune from sort of normal prosecution. I think it's a very fascinating question to ask. It, would it also um, be immune from uh, the disqualification clause? Because the disqualification clause clearly contemplates that a senator or a member of Congress could be disqualified under it. And then we get to the sort of question that you see in the Cooey Griffin case, like is cheerleading the insurrection being an insurrectionist? I mean, I would think that if you are not voting to certify a lawful vote, that that's pretty much cheerleading the insurrection. But I, I think it's sort of a closer question once you think about the, the speech and debate clause implications of that. No, and I think the book is really nuanced on this, is that there there are things you would just like the voters to hold and shareholders to hold people accountable to. So in terms of the Sedition Caucus, you would like voters to not put them back in office, and you would like corporations not to be contributing money to help them be back in office. So it's interesting. Like you're, it, There's not a one-size-fits-all uh, approach that you're recommending in the book. You're saying this is a very, very complicated problem and it's going to require, you know, multiple prongs to to treat. Another one that you, uh, the things that you think might be effective, you've already mentioned earlier, which is the use of jail. And I just wanted to say a, a little bit more about how penalties can be an effective means of holding people accountable. And I'm also wondering, in, in addition to accountability, is it also serve as a deterrence? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I have uh, my whole chapter on civil death where I'm pretty critical of the way that the criminal justice system treats sort of the average person. Uh, I think, the way I think about it is that for the average person, once they get sucked into the criminal justice system, their lives are well and truly ruined. Uh, but at the upper echelons, when you're talking about people in enormous amounts of power, like those who have held the presidency, one of the things that I always used to teach my constitutional law students is that no one in America is above the law, including the president. And there were great cases that I could point to, like the Clinton case and the Nixon case, where really aggressive presidents had really pushed it and the Supreme Court had actually pushed back. And now we have this Trump immunity decision, which is horrifying, uh, where the court essentially says, no, 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 if it's an official presidential act that you can find in Article Two of the Constitution, then it's fine. Absolute immunity for those acts. That is really, uh, it's novel, it's new law. It doesn't seem consistent with the text and history of the Constitution. And yet here, here we all are. So, uh, and I'll just say really briefly, because I, I, maybe we'll leave some time at the end to talk about the immunity decision because it couldn't get in here. What you just said about uh, the history and tradition is essential. Anything. The one thing I am more knowledgeable uh, uh, about is, is the Federalist Papers, the letters that uh, the Federal Convention notes, the state ratification notes. Every single one of them says the same thing, which is the concern is about the tyranny of the executive. The concern is about limiting power. 
And yet in this immunity decision, we don't see any attention to that, any attention to the fundamentals of you are trying to keep the executive. It's very hard to control the executive. They, ha they have the power over the military. And so to take that away is just, it's shocking, really. But okay, we'll leave some time, I promise, at the end uh, to do that. But I interrupted you. So I think it's actually really important that Trump could be uh, held criminally responsible for the various crimes that he stands accused of. So as we are speaking together, the New York state court system has found him guilty of 34 criminal uh, felony counts. And he has not been sentenced. So we don't know whether this will be, you know, I mean, you'd be everything from you're just on probation to you have to have a ankle monitor as you wander the halls of Mar-a-Lago to actually sending him to be imprisoned. So we don't know where on that spectrum Judge Mershon is going to um, end up, but I think it's really important that you treat him like you would treat any other criminal defendant. So if other people who have broken the same types of laws, have spent uh, time incarcerated, then he shouldn't get special treatment just because he is an ex-president. And I think this is particularly important in his January 6th case. Uh, we don't know how that's going to end. Judge Chutkin has to sort through all sorts of arguments over what's immune and what's not immune. What it is good about the immunity decision is it says that if something is done entirely in someone's private capacity, in their capacity as a candidate for federal office, that is not immune. So almost everything that Trump stands accused of in the both the original and superseding indictment that Jack Smith has filed against him in the January 6th case it's talking about him as a candidate. And so we don't know how all of this is going to end, but I don't think the immunity decision is going to be as helpful to him in that case as he thinks it's going to be. Because I think judges, until we get perhaps to the Supreme Court, are going to hold him accountable for what he did as a candidate. I mean, he's clearly trying to overturn the 2020 election so that he can remain in power. That is, those are moves that a candidate makes. That is not something that is a Article II power that the president has. And you said earlier about uh, the executive uh, having the same penalties, and this is fundamental. This is not something in your book. This is something fundamental since the 17th century, the idea that the rule of law requires uh, the 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 leader to be held and all governing people to be held to these same standards, the law has to apply to them. This is, this is what makes things different. Uh, it's, what, it's, it's what defines us as a country. Okay, I want to get to the um, democracy litmus test, which I love, but there's one quick thing that I think we need to do, which is that you, you have this wonderful section of the book in which, again, you have something that we can understand, which is a football game in which the Cowboys and the Eagles are playing at AT&T Stadium in Arlington, and a plane flies overhead with a banner that says AT&T, number one abortion ban network in the U.S. And you take that very, we can all understand it, banner, but you analyze it through something that most people don't care about, which is um, the prudence and loyalty. Uh, you know. So, so anyway, I'm going to let you explain it better than I can, but uh, it's about the Con Congressional Review Act and these, these rules. So this goes back to what you said earlier, that you want corporations to be held responsible by their own stockholders. So can, can you explain a little bit about why this um, DOL ESG rule embedded in the Congressional Review Act at, empowers this plane flying over a football game and what consequences it has for AT&T or other corporations? Okay. So um, for those who work on corporate governance and shareholder rights, what they find in my book uh, 
will not be news to them because there's been this uh, low level battle going on at the general shareholder meetings of major corporations for about the past 15 years. And essentially what this fight is about is should shareholders have more say over corporations' ESG practices? So their environmental, social, and governance practices. And in that world of ESG, political spending is considered one of them. And so what shareholders have been doing, to their credit, is they've been using the rights that they have under U.S. securities laws. And they have been putting in shareholder proposals on all sorts of things. So, you know, tell us about your supply chain. Is it, uh, what are the environmental impacts of the, you know, the mining that you might rely on for your, the sources of the metals in your cell phones, things like that. Uh, and they've also been asking for more transparency of corporate political spending in elections and corporate lobbying expenditures. And that has been spearheaded mostly by unions, because unions have a lot of money invested in the stock market. They invest so that their retirees, once they hit the retirement age, have something to come home with, some money comes in, uh, which also makes uh, union pension funds really big players as shareholder advocates. So in some states, it's actually like the teacher's union or the union that represents other public employees and their retirements. And they, the people who run those entities tend to be very progressive and thoughtful. They also know the securities laws. So they are using this ability to bring these issues to other shareholders. And they've been doing this for like, you know, at least the last 15 years. Meanwhile, <laughs> corporations don't like this one bit, most corporations. And they have been pushing back hard. And one of the things that they have tried to do is get these shareholder proposals off the proxy. And that means that they get into these sort of like three-way fights with the Securities and Exchange Commission who has to act as the referee of like whether these things go on or not. Uh, and so depending on who's running the Securities and Exchange Commission, you can have um, sort of very lenient allowance of the shareholder proposals coming on like during the Obama administration and during the Biden administration. And then, you know, not surprisingly, during the Trump administration, they were siding more with business and actually taking off some of these rules. Meanwhile, over at the Department of Labor, which has to deal with um, uh, pension funds and things like that, uh, DOL uh, decided to have a rule that's that made it clear that these organizers, like the people who run these pension funds, actually can take into account the ESG track record of different corporations when they are investing. And that was the rule that uh, Congress tried to get removed using the Congressional Review Act. So this act allows Congress to um, babysit the administrative state and take out rules that they don't like that an administrative agency has passed. And so there were enough votes in Congress to uh, try to nix out this uh, Department of Labor ESG rule. And that is actually Biden's first veto, uh, which I think also doesn't get a lot of press. But and when Biden vetoes this, it means that this good rule at the Department of Labor can go into effect. And that means that the people who are doing these investments on behalf of these retirees can actually think about, like, is this a firm that has horrible uh, climate change implications? 
is this a firm that has slave labor in its supply chain? Is this a firm that is using corporate political spending uh, in a really either pernicious or dark way? And they can take that into account and decide, let's put our retirees money into a firm that's actually environmentally responsible uh, good with their labor practices, you know, good uh, with uh, being transparent about money and politics. And that has, like, if you read the Wall Street Journal's uh, op-ed page, they hate this. <laughs> um, but in some ways, if you don't read the, the Wall Street Journal's um, op-ed page, you have no idea that this fight is even going on. So, okay, so there are tools for uh, shareholders and the people who invest to to think about this. And though Congress tried to remove it, they didn't. And it's still there. And it's a tool, as you say in the book, that can be very, very effective going forward, especially with trying to keep money out of violence in politics, sedition in politics, et cetera. Okay, and the book closes with what you call your democracy litmus test. And you want voters to ask some questions. You want to ask of the person you're voting, um, have they perpetuated election denial? Uh, did they try to overthrow the results of any election? Uh, are they pushing legislation to make voting more difficult? And are they party to bribery or other corrupt actions that might undermine democratic values? And and you would like each voter to just ask that question of um, the people that they are voting for. And so I just, how do you think this, do, do you think this can be operationalized? Who would operationalize it? Like, would we need a public intellectual? Would we need an organization? Is the book enough? Would we need the press behind this? But uh, I mean, I think this is so compelling. How do you see this happening? Well, I think we saw versions of this happen in uh, the midterm election that we just had in 2022. The thing that I was encouraged by is many different news outlets went through the trouble of trying to figure out which election deniers were on the ballot. And it was hundreds of them. So that, that took some legwork. But what uh, different outlets would do is it would show you as a voter whether you had an election denier on your ballot, which is, I think, where the rubber meets the road. And then that voter could decide, like, you know, I like his this policy, but I don't like his election denial policy and, you know, decide accordingly, you know, it's up to the voter at the at the end of the day. But it, having that information was crucial because I think a lot of people, especially once you get to the down ballot races, you have no idea who these people are and doing the research is hard. And so having the press actually sort of name names like, yeah, 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 either this guy was at January 6th because there were some of those as well. Like there was uh, one character here in Florida, he was running for office from pretrial detention for his actions on January 6th. I mean, that's really bold. That's a little belief in yourself that uh, despite my being incarcerated this very moment uh, for trying to overturn a different election, I'm nonetheless going to stand for election myself. He fortunately lost. And lots of election deniers in 2022 lost. And I think part of why they lost is that the press was able to name and shame them. And so I hope that uh, similar things happen in the 2024 election because some of these characters are back. Uh, and we shall see. I mean, I... I probably still have some PTSD from the 2016 election where going into that election, the predicted winner did not turn out to be the predicted winner. So I am pretty allergic to polls at this point. I don't care who's ahead in the polls right now. I just want voters to make sure that they're registered, make a plan to vote and like follow through and show up at your polling place uh, because your democracy really needs you. Um, 
you note in the very final sentence of the book that it was going to press as Trump's criminal trial in Manhattan was beginning. And you've said in the podcast that you had to keep re rewriting things. And, and it's interesting because it, even though you didn't have that criminal trial to unpack in the book, it's as if you did because you mentioned lots of things that are, are, are really, really relevant. So I, as we're finishing, I just want to give you some space. Like, so since the book came out, since you had to hand it over to the press, is there something in particular that you think uh, has happened that puts this, uh, challenges anything that's in the book or reinforces what's in the book? Ah, well, um, the 2024 election is on track to be, once again, the most expensive election in history. And we already have over a billion dollars that's been raised by our presidential candidates so far. We've also had over a billion dollars in outside political money. We've had over $150 million in dark money so far. We won't know what all of the ultimate totals in the 2024 election is until months after the election is over. But uh, one of the things that really jumps out to me is who the big corporate donors to super PACs are so far in the 2024 election. And I'm just going <laughs> to read off the top six. Coinbase, Ripple, Coke Industries, Jump Crypto, Occidental, and Chevron. And if you don't recognize the names of some of those companies, it these are the industries they are in. Crypto, crypto, oil, crypto, oil, oil. And I sort of suspect that th these two <laughs> industries are going to have an outsized impact on who wins the 2024 election who wins the White House, who controls the House, who controls the Senate, who wins certain governorships, and who controls state legislatures. And the weird thing about especially the crypto money is they spend an enormous amount of money on ads, mostly trashing candidates, mostly trashing incumbents, and they don't mention the word crypto once in the ad. So they're just, you know, seemingly trashing some uh, politician and trying to convince the public don't vote for that uh, incumbent. And but you really have to like dig a little to realize, oh, it's a cryptocurrency uh, company. What they really are pushing for is deregulation or no regulation for their industry. And I just wish it was more transparent to voters and I would just say, whenever you see a political ad, take it with a grain of salt, do a little research to see whether a person who is being um, bashed by a political ad even deserves it. I mean, it, it you do have to do a little bit more um, inquiry than just passively receiving information, but I think it's worth it because, you know, for example, uh, and I just wrote about this for Long Crime, these crypto um, currency uh, spenders, they're attacking John Tester and they're attacking Sherrod Brown. I'm pretty sure they're attacking Sherrod Brown because he is the chair of the banking committee in the Senate. And they don't want that committee to regulate their industry. And again, the ads don't mention crypto. They just attack him as being unworthy of your vote. Well, I think the first step for voters is to read this book before the election. It gives them examples and sources and ways of thinking. Um, thank you so much for writing the book uh, and for the career that allowed you to write the book previously. This book comes out of a lot of work and research and um, legal action and briefs written. So thank you so much for that. Um, We've been talking about Chara Torres Bellisi's Corporatocracy, How to Protect Democracy from Dark Money and Corrupt Politicians, published by NYU Press in 2024. Chara, thank you so much for joining the podcast. It was a delight.